So let's talk about really quickly just a couple things to review. Israel has an obsession. Uh, obsession is idolatry. Uh, we talked about that last time, that especially when we talked about not only the giant cow, but the, all the little idols leading down the street to the giant cow. And that wasn't just in that one spot, but throughout, throughout Israel. And then the calf of Bethel uh, was sanctioned by the king. This is very important because chapter, chapter 9 is... So chapter 8 and chapter 9 are sort of going together because God's still talking. Like we've always said. Your Bible breaks it into chapters, and sometimes it gets it very right. Like it feels like that's a natural break. And then there's other times where it's it's uh, very just very wrong. Um, and sometimes it's off by like a verse, and sometimes it's off by uh, a little bit. I would put these two chapters back together. And then people were saying at the end of it, by the life of the God, is what they mean by the life of a lump of metal made to look like a giant cow. That's really what they were saying. Because that's who they're putting their faith in, is, is this other thing. So, uh, I think I put, yeah, I put the little cow on there, just to help you. But that's what they're saying. They're putting their, well, they're, well, they're putting their faith in. Now, one of the things that we give Israel trouble is that they're actually admitting this. Where I want to talk about it really quickly is, at least they will admit it. Okay? Uh, you think about our culture today, they have a belief in, you know, Many, many gods. Most of most important is their, you know, self, God of self. But at least Israel was willing to admit it. And, you know, this is who we believe in. And, uh, and so I, I have to give them at least that much credit because our culture doesn't even want to do that, right? Uh, what do you believe in? Well, it just, well, it kind of depends. Anytime someone, anybody's time someone answers you with, well, just understand that's where that process starts. So let's go to no place to hide. I like this. Chapter, chapter number 9, verse number 1. Um, uh, Ms. Ruthie, can I ask you to read? Because it looks like you have your Bible app open from here. <laughs> Great. How far down? Just, just, just verse 1. Okay. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the top of the pillars so that the threshold shake. Bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away, none will escape. Uh, incredible verse. Um, this is, again, this is probably one of those verses that you will never see a Hobby Lobby, okay? <laughs> um, and the reason for that is that look at where God begins. God begins his judgment at the altar. Now, I want you to know there's a couple of things. This could have been this could have been the temple in Samaria, but it's probably not because of the context. If I go back to chapter eight, remember he's standing in front of the giant altar of the cow in Bethel. That's probably where he's starting at. Why would he start out on an altar? <clears throat> well, remember that this we're still in the Old Testament. The main form of worship of God is altar worship. Um, sacrificing, they're doing those types of things. So God is going to start this with the judgment of a false god. He's going to start, you know, he's going to burn it. He's literally going to take it and melt it down. That's what he talks about. The pillars, breaking it down. So that's going to literally destroy the whole temple. Side note about this is that whenever the Assyrians come through, one of the things that they're really good at is uh, burning everything. Um, especially temples, um, because they are trying to demoralize the whole community. How would you do that? Well, you burn down their homes and you burn down their worship centers. And if there's nothing for them to go back to, then that's then it makes it even harder for them to come back. Sometimes it says beside, and sometimes it says on. All we're here after is it really is this whole idea of of the temple, of the altar being destroyed. That's the reason why I continue. So whose altar is this? Well, I go back to it being the false, the false altar at Bethel. There's no escape from the judgment of God. This is what he's really after. There's, 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 there's no escape. There's none. And I want you to know what, who you hear, who you do not hear through this process anymore is Amos. Amos is not standing up saying, you know, God, 
they can't stake that. They can't. No, they can't do that. Um, ever since the ever since God started speaking with the plumb line, outside of outside of Amos taking on the personal attack, the rest of this has all been the voice of God. So that's how you guys think about through this. There's no refuge. All right, let's go from two to four. Um, who, uh, Christy, do you have your Bible open? All right, verses two through four. If they dig into shell, from there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I will search them out and take them. If they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. If they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. Uh, yeah. Uh, they're, not they're not hiding, are they? There's nowhere to hide. Uh, what's really, uh, if you if you get into a study, specifically uh, whenever you're studying the book of Revelation, there's a lot of this sort of uh, same type of speech happening. If you go to the book of Revelation, you remember how they'll have talks about people will call down from the mountain to fall upon them, hoping to hide them. But even then, God says there's nowhere for them to hide. So this is all hypothetical places of refuge. Now, are they going to get to go to any of these places? No. But what's the point? What the, going back to the point, what's the point? There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere they can go. And that's trying to help them understand that. No hell, uh, hell, Michelle, heaven, top of Mount Carmel. Uh, the reason they, again, are, uh, they talk about this as a location, go back to chapter 1, talks about it, is this is the highest mountain in their, in their, in their land. That's, all, that's the reason why this keeps getting mentioned over and over again, is it's just the highest, it's just the highest spot that they have left. So if you think you could go up high, even, you know, okay, if I can't get to heaven, let me go to the highest place that I can get to. Um, I can't go there. Um, I can't go to the bottom of the sea, which is really interesting because since it's in the sea, the animal will go and bite you. Um, but then, captivity. What, say, what will happen whenever they go into captivity? Sword. Sword. They're going to die. And, and, we, do, and we do know that. Um, there's, a, there's a seriousness of God's anger. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. Um, I want you to know, so let's be good Christians, good Bible scholars just for a little bit. This is a verse that bothers Christians. Why, why is that? God is love. Yeah, God is love. God is good. And he is. So what about, what about that word? What's that harm? Why, 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 do, why, why, why would a Christian struggle with a verse like this? You got the picture that God's going to hurt anybody or anything. Uh, my, my problem is I don't believe Christians struggle with that. I believe go. feel good Christians. Okay. They want feel good sermons. Uh huh. Who want right. to feel good God right. are the ones that struggle. But go back to what Sue's point was. What? It's, I, I have this idea, I have a. Um, almost to a point of false idea of God because I've, I've created God in my image and so you know um, what's the one I forget what the saying is right at the moment that you know it's like the, it's like the big daddy type of God whenever this, this makes God a little bit more complex and what do we do with like we, uh, and again, it goes back to my whole thing. I, if I'm going to study a loving God, which is an attribute of Him, I've also got to study a holy God. I've got to study a just God. I've got to study a God who eventually will say, "Look, I'm I'm going to set my eyes on Him." And and where do I have to sit as a Christian? Who, at the end of the day, who do I have to say is right? God. God. What, and, and, and can, and let me also help you as a, as a Christian. It's okay for you to say, if someone says, well, why do you think that is? It's okay for you to say, I don't know. Okay? 
another another thing with Christianity is we always feel like we have to like we either have to explain it or explain it away. Sometimes it's true. Look, this is what God said. We're and specifically when we're in the Old Testament, especially with Amos, what can we do? I can march that forward and I can show you how this came to be. And I don't have to go that far into it. And it was destruction. It was annihilation. Um, by the time you get to Ezra and Nehemiah, guess what they're no longer doing? They're no longer saying they're from whatever, whichever tribe they're from because they kind of don't know. Right? Because of all of this. So, someone, let's talk about the power of God. Verses 5 and 6. So let's talk about the statement of God's power. Okay? Miss Sue, will you read for us, please? And the Lord God of hosts is he that touches the land, and it shall melt, and all that dwell therein shall mourn. And it shall rise up wholly, like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in heaven, in the heaven, and hath founded his truth, truth in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. I love this. One of the, one of the things I love doing, uh, our, our world is, is fascinating. It's very beautiful. It's those types of things. It's, it's very powerful, too, right, if we study it. So this is a statement of the power of God. I notice what he says, the touch will melt. And we can, and I'm going to show you some of those examples here in a moment, but what, you know, you think about the touching and melting, like, wow. Like, that really shouldn't surprise us if we go back to Genesis and we believe that what did God have to do to create all of it? He just spoke. He's that powerful. But what is he saying here is, like, we're talking about a complete destruction. So that's the reason for talking about melting. He does create, um, and he made the waters. I, I always love that. There's a beautiful verse, you, can, you know, the whole cup of the waters in his hands. I, I love that. But let's talk, let's just show a little bit of it. So, you know, I, you, you can go to Hubble. I love some of those images. Uh, this is a, this is actually the sunrise taken, um, actually almost from the moon. Um, but I, I love that because what does it show? It shows the power of the sun and how God created all these things just for us to give us light. You talk about melting. Uh, I instantly think of, of volcanoes. Um, you know, our joke always is when you talk about someone who's making, uh, they're about ready to buy a house or buy a piece of property. I'm like, look, they're not making land anymore. Um, and where they are, it's very dangerous, okay? <laughs> um, but, and then, you know, you look at the sea, and uh, I always love this image. This is, a, this is an image where um, there's a lot of fresh water being dumped into the ocean. And it happens every so often, and it creates this line where you can actually see the differences between the salt water in the ocean and the fresh water. And I love these because God's telling Amos and through Amos telling all of Israel, I'm, I'm responsible for all that. You don't think that I can't stand up to your puny little God? I, you know, he's really, you say, I, you know, let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis. He used water, flood the whole thing. No, I'm gonna hit the reset button. Start this whole thing all over again. What did what did they really for, what have they really done? They forgot. They forgot God and the power of God. So destruction. Let's talk about destruction with the promise. So seven through seven and eight. Taylor, you got your Bible app up? Yeah. Okay, good. Verse seven and eight. Yep, cut the Kushites. To me, O people of Israel, declare the Lord, did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Asher mm -hmm. and the Syrians from Kerr? Mm -hmm. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. Okay. Oh, so what's, what's the last verse in there? What's the last thing she just read? I will not utterly destroy the house. Why? That's the, that, 
Uh, through all of this, there's the promise. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a whole lot of a promise, does it? Do you? <laughs> but, so let's talk about it. Uh, the Cushites um, are the Ethiopians. Uh, they're a pagan nation, a sinful uh, kingdom. They're the ones, uh, so uh, ge geographically, they are south of Egypt. They're sort of in that, still that horn of, of, of Africa. They're, but they're close enough where they're still known. Does that make sense to you? Like, they're, they're not, it's not like they're next door neighbors, but word of them has, has, has made it up to Israel. Israel is, is in a, a beautiful place because if you go back and you study it, people that travel almost have to travel through Israel. And it's a beautiful idea. Why is that? Well, it helps them introduce to a number of people. I love the, uh, again, reminding of the past. Let's see what we're reminding them of. Well, let's go back to Egypt. Moses fought, fought off. Let's go to the Philistines. Here's King David and King Saul. Let's go to the Syrians. Time after time after time. Now, up until this point in time, God continued to protect Israel. He fought for Israel. He sent warriors. So what he's doing is now is saying, look, I've protected you. What do you think will happen whenever I turn towards you? But there is. What does he do at the very end of it? <laughs> he gave him a little hope. <laughs> Why is that? Because we're going to talk about all the things that are going to happen. Now, this is a great, this is a Sunday school answer, right? Who... Who will pass the judgment? The answer is God, right? Nine and ten. So let's talk about, I want to speed this up just a little bit. It says you're going to be sifted as a fine sieve. Uh, you're, we're going to be talking about this because he actually uses my people. Um, let, me, let me go back. Christy, could you read one more time for me? Go first to nine and ten. Let me, let's, let's go ahead and read this. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with the sieve. But no pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say, Disaster shall not overtake or meet us. So you be destroyed by the sword. My people. Go back. Where whenever God introduced them, he says, You will be my people. I will be your God. But now what does he have to do? He's having to separate them. He's having to he's having to, he's having to judge them. Before you get let, and it's going to be tough, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be harsh. Hopeful words like "my people," you get, they have to hang on to. Going, especially whenever you get to the place of where Ezra and Nehemiah are going back, they were the "my people" that survived. Okay, they are the ones who. There, it's not this, not this generation. It's going to be what their children, their grandchildren. They're going to hold on to what did God call them? My people. The heart of those being destroyed. There's a there's an idea here that this really is this whole this whole idea of this is what's what is God going after? Their heart. Would you just change? You know, in my head, I'm going Amos. I, I almost feel like Amos is going. But you know, if you could just change your heart, this, well, you know, we could we could have missed most of this. And then God's going, no, no, we couldn't have. Okay. <laughs> because their hearts are never going to change. So let's talk about that day. Mr. Chad, will you read for us? I need to, I really just need verse 11. In that day I will rise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise, it, raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Okay. On that day... There's a day, it points to a day of what, what we would call a day of salvation. Salvation, don't think of salvation in the way that we would use the term salvation. Uh, you probably want to think of the word more of a, as, a, as a restoration, okay? A restoring. Who are they restoring? The booth of David. Okay, go back. <laughs> Remember, we're in a divided kingdom. Why are we in a divided kingdom? After King David, there was King Solomon. Under King Solomon, it was one, it was one 
ruled. After King Solomon is when it divided. It reminds Israel that they had rejected David, David's dynasty. It was supposed to be David's sons that, that were to be the king from then on. What did they do? They rejected it. They, they, they broke up, they broke up, the, they broke up the, the band, right? Yahweh promised David. What, what, was, what was the promise? What was David's promise? David's promise was there will always be. There will always be a king. That you're reliable. There will always be a, a king. Go forward with me with this. No, again, be good Bible scholars. Go forward with me. When we get to the New Testament, we get to Matthew and specifically Matthew and Luke. <laughs> Mary and Joseph were the house and lineage of David. That's important. Why? Because what's, what's happening? Fulfillment of a promise. God never, God never gave up on the promise. What He's trying to help them understand is that you, as a, you as a people, left the promise. God will not. That's very important. But again, we don't get that one if we if we don't study the rest of our Bible. There's a reason why I love this. I love Amos was this book that allowed me to see that my Bible is actually connected more than just with the spine of the book. Okay? It helped me see that I needed to study Genesis. I need to study Matthew. I need to study Luke. I need to go back and grab grab jo you know, uh, Joseph and, and, and go forward with his sons and all of that. Let's talk about remnant of Edom. Mr. Steve, could you read for us? I just need verse 12. <clears throat> okay. So that they may possess the remnant of Edom, Edom all the nations that bear my name declares the Lord who will do these things. Okay. Remnant of Edom. Real quick. Remnant is left after the punishment uh, that's going to happen. James actually quotes this later. Um, the remnant will be talking about to the Gentiles. Now, uh, now I'm going to go ahead and give you the rest of this. It's an act of sovereign grace and it's proclaimed. But why is that? Because what did he leave? He left a remnant. He left a little. What could he have done? What could have God, could have God done? He could have erased it all. Mocked them off the face of the planet. Started over. Found another group of people. And I will be your God and you shall be my people. And here we go again. He did. Why? He left a remnant because he's God. He's going to fulfill all of his promises. Now, this remnant is just to remember. We go back, go back to chapter three of Amos. Go back to chapter four of Amos. He talks about how there's only going to be a very few that are going to survive. Whenever I think, think about this, it doesn't take me too much to go forward with this. Go, let's go forward into where we are as Christians today. How many? You know, I would love to say that there's more Christians now than there was then. It's, that's hard for me to say now. Why? Again, I go back to true Christianity. How many people are there? Well, God's promised us that the church will be here until he comes back. This is this, whenever we look at this, I, I look at this really good in him fulfilling his promises. And it really is that God, God said, I'm going to do this. No one else can take, no one else can take credit and or blame for Verse number 13 is a really odd verse because it actually talks about the rebirth, okay? It talks about how the, the plowman is going to catch the harvester. Now, the one who plows will overtake the one who reaps. Now, this is imagery, and you're going, why? the first question you should really ask, why are both of these people out at the same time? <laughs> right? Because if I'm plowing, I'm definitely not in the season of harvest, am I? Those are two very, even, even me, who is not a farmer, I understand. Those are two different seasons. What God is saying is, once this is over and we start again, the ground's going to be so fertile, you're going to do so well, that you're actually going to be able to do both. Now, I want you to think about this. 
when when will we get to see even a glimpse of this? Again, you got to go all the way forward to Ezra. What does Ezra do? What does Ezra and Nehemiah do? Remember what what Nehemiah they get sent back. They get they get to bring their their people back. And what do they do? They rebuild the temple. They rebuild the wall. They start again. And then what happens? The Bible is silent for 400 years. What did they do for 400 years? They had to teach. They had to harvest. They had to reap. They had to get ready. As soon as the harvest is complete, the land can be plowed and planted. Uh, the mountains will drip uh, sweet wine. This is actually a verse Joel uses a lot. We'll get to replanting in Israel. Last verse. I think this is our last verse. Um, 9, 9 verse number 14. Uh, Mr. Tom, would you read verse 14 for us, please? And I will bring again the captivity of my people uh, of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make garments and eat the fruit of them. So what does this sound like destruction? No. What does it sound like? This, this sounds like hope. Right? Now, remember, huh, Amos is nine chapters long. How much how much how much hope have we got out of those nine chapters? Remember the first remember the first couple of verses? <laughs> I will not turn away. I will focus on you and you will get all of my wrath. Now what is it saying? It's going to be time. There, there, there will eventually be a time again. Whenever you'll be able to make clothes, you'll celebrate, you'll, you'll do these things. All of that comes back. Restoration, verse number 15. Uh, Mr. Chad, would you read for us one more time, please? I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. For Israel, this is ground of their restoration, God's original choice of them as his people. Remember, we have to go all the way back. What is Israel? Israel is a chosen people with a specific piece of land. Okay? When, when will we see this? When will we see this verse? Okay, last verse. When will we see this fulfilled? The answer is, you have to go to Revelation chapter about 20. <laughs> Why? What are they still doing? What are they doing right now over this piece of land? They're fighting over it. Who, who does it belong to? Who, does it, who, who has the right to it? Who does not have the right to it? You know? Um, I mean, we can go, we can talk about history if it had, you know. Even the state of Israel now has, you know, problems with this and that. So when will when will they have full restoration? When will they be when will they be complete? Well, you have to go you have to go really far far forward, and that's always the Book of Revelation. That's where that, this is where this book ends. I want you to know. So I'm going to leave. So we're 